Économie politique euh, internationale à l'université d'East Anglia, au Royaume-Uni. Et euh, votre projet de recherche actuel, c'est Growth of African Financial Networks. Euh, et elle porte sur l'économie politique, justement, des flux financiers des systèmes, et des systèmes financiers émergents en Afrique, justement, dans euh, votre intervention sera l'objet. Et euh, vous travaillez en ce moment sur une monographie euh, dont le titre est The Political Economy of African Financial Centers, euh, donc le nouveau royaume de la finance mondiale. Je me suis permis voilà. de traduire. Uh, welcome, Andrew Fisher. <laughs> It was not coordinated. Yes, please, please. <laughs> But it's perfectly uh, directed. Uh, so, uh, I will introduce you in French. Vous êtes professeur agrégé de politique sociale et d'études de développement. You must... Ah, d'accord, vous parlez français en plus. D'accord. J'allais vous dire que vous devez me faire confiance puisque. <laughs> Très bien. Donc, pour ce qui est de votre recherche, vous êtes centré sur le rôle de la redistribution dans le développement à l'échelle locale, régionale et mondiale. Donc, vous approchez cette question avec trois angles les processus financiers et fiscaux, la politique sociale et la politique de développement productif. Et nous allons vous écouter juste après. Et maintenant, la parole est à vous. Please. Thank you very much. Sorry, um, sorry one, go ahead. One word, 20 minutes. Uh, sure, and so if you kind of like do this something at five. Five, okay. Okay, good. Like the 20 minutes of the last session? Or? <laughs> <laughs> this is I'm, a real 20 minutes. I have the full rights from my head to be an authoritarian, so I will enjoy that. Please, well, Elizabeth. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Elizabeth. I'm very happy that you went and had a coffee break before. Because now you're going to be a little bit better and sustain a little bit of caffeine in the blood to listen. Otherwise, I would have been wiping you off the floor. Okay. So this is a chapter out of my forthcoming book uh, looking at the emergence of financial centers in Africa. And I come from a different, I feel like I'm coming from a different place altogether than the conference thus far. So I do international political economy. I don't do development. I look at finance. I look at financial architecture as it's emerging within Africa. So, whoops. So, the kind of broad question I'm asking, and, I, and it's very macro, um, is what is the financial geography that is emerging across the continent? How do we understand that? And they're kind of like, I'll, I'll explain a bit further on about the processes and uh, that I, the historical processes that I think are driving finance across the continent. But really I'm looking at this whole um, monetary driven, sort of the model that's coming out of the European Union about having sub-regional monetary unions that will somehow stitch up into a future African monetary union, which is really the template that African Union has been using since the 1960s about how to integrate continentally. So what you really have here is ECOWAS, East Africa, Southern Africa, really trying to integrate sub-regionally and then somehow make this up into a continental um, block. Basically, I'm saying is that that's not going to happen. I don't believe it's going to happen. Everyone else believes it's going to happen. I don't, right? So it's a bold statement. Or what I'm thinking is happening really is that the global financial geography around the world, which is more and more centered in cities and in financial centers, is going to be extended into Africa through states who are actually hooking out and embedding financial networks into geographical sites. So, I'm, so there is still a sub-regional logic that's happening here, and I'll, I'll show which I think are to be the leading financial centers. Um, but this brings up much more a question of, of geopolitics, collaboration, coordination, and global forces looking, for example, at how China's Belt and Road Initiative coming into Africa, particularly on the east coast of Africa, are affecting infrastructure and affecting the, the rise of these centers. So lots of context. Just to say, okay, when I'm looking at this, what are, what are the things I'm looking at as part of the shaping of the continent? History of, of colonial monetary unions, no monetary autonomy. And for me, this is a really good reason why I don't think that there will be monetary integration at sub-regional level. I don't think states are prepared to relegate on the sovereignty that comes uh, with monetary union. Obviously, we're having the continuing CFA zones, and the financial center for that still being in Paris, like we have the financial centers in New York and, and Britain, still being in Paris, and the RAND in southern, Europe, southern uh, Africa, which I see as being a imperial or a colonial monetary agreement within southern Africa. Just recently, there was this question of Zimbabwe 
going to the Reserve Bank in South Africa and saying, well, maybe we should adopt the rand as part of our, as our currency. And finally, that the constraints that the Reserve Bank in South Africa put onto Zimbabwe were too great. So it's the same thing. Any monetary union will have to have the constraints on the leading power and how they see the management of that money, whether it's in Paris or whether it's in Johannesburg. Independence. So basically, once you have the independence, it was constrained then because at the same time you have the independence, you have the breaking down of the Bretton Woods area, sorry, and, and, and period. And f the finance re-rose like a phoenix from the ashes to become the dominant, one of the dominant structures across the world. At the same time as you have basically finance unleashing, you have the template of the European EU model of regional economic and political integration. So this is very technocratic. This is the idea that you know, South Africa can just replicate what's happening in Europe and transplant it into Africa. This, of course, touches into the old nerves of pan-African idealism of unity coming out of you know, the, the, the discussions in the 1960s, the division between the Monrovia and the Casablanca groups, how do you go about African unity? So it touches a chord, and the African Monetary Union touches a chord. Uh, so basically, the whole EU model ignores uh, what I think is most important, which is power, competition, geopolitics, global capitalism, and, and even development. It also ignores the role of cities. We take in the state as our unit of analysis, and that is no longer sufficient in our globalizing world where we need to understand cities and subnational levels of organization. So basically talking to the, to the research um, like Cassis, capitals of capital. So the argument I'm making, um, I'll come to my argument, is basically the current debate on deeper regional integration to establish the African Monetary Union is both premature and it's outdated. It's premature because now that we have signed the African Free Trade Agreement, we're all excited, we can see, oh yeah, well that's the next step, you know, African Monetary Union. But in fact, there are, um, if you have a look, 301 regional agreements on trade in the world, and if you put aside the, the um, colonial monetary unions, there's only one example of monetary union, which is the, which is the European Union. So, 300 regional agreements is easy to do. Should has challenges, but this is the lowest level of commitment of involvement in regional blocks is trade. The deepest is monetary union. So in a way, it's very premature to even talking about that. We can have a functional FTA across Africa and never get to a, a monetary union. It's outdated because the AMU doesn't reflect, I don't think, what's happening as global geography around the world which is global financial geography through international financial centers. So my argument is that the extension of the world's geography of global finance and public authority, so looking at states, will be articulated through international financial centers. And this, I believe, denotes a different relationship of African states to global capitalism. So I'm not saying this is better. I'm not talking about how emancipatory this will be. IFAs are not, IFCs are not emancipatory. I'm saying that I believe that this is what's taking place. So I can see sort of five entangled processes that are taking place in, in the globe, and I'm sure that there are many others, and I haven't got them all. But it's certainly this pan-African ideal of unity, which is sort of the, um, the, the glue that binds. It's what the African Development Bank says, what the African Union says. Then you have the European-led African integration model, which is coming out there, the colonial legacies of monetary unions, and the expansion of European template. At the same time, you have the expanding global geography of finance through international financial centers and big cities. You have public authorities, which are states and sub-national level governments, who are actually doing all they can to make sure that global finance comes into their main leading hubs and economic sites in their territories. So really, they're, hooking, they're reaching out and hooking finance into their sovereign territories. Financial inclusion of the unbanked, I won't look at that now, but that's certainly a big factor coming into the whole idea of financial integration across the continent. So Africa is a really, very, very different case studies. Nowhere in the world are you trying to integrate a large, ca large case of 54 countries. It is phenomenal in, in sense of collection of active problems. There's no way that you can try and get 54 countries to come together from a pers perspective of post-coloniality, shallow financial markets, informal cash economy, digitization of money with fintech, 
unbanked population, uneven development, high inequality, exploded demographics, rapid urbanization. So in that context, do we really think that we can bring a large N of 54 into an agreement for a single monetary union? I think it's absolutely unrealistic. So this gives Africa a very exceptional um, case study to look at. How do you try and have this project of integration and deeper reliance and intra-trade on the continent with a very uh, complex context that I've just set out? So I'm looking at this, uh, Randall Germain's work um, of International Organization of Credit in 1997, which is kind of the framework I've been thinking about. The idea of hooking in and, and states being in the, in the driving seat of finance as well is the work of Eric Heiliner. So Randall Germain talks about the era of decentralized globalization and a twofold movement. And this is what I understand that's happening on the African continent. So global financial architecture, which is really how it's hung together by the different rules and regulations, practices, and geography, as it was during the Bretton Woods era. So the way we understand global financial architecture of the 20th century under Bretton Woods is no longer dominated by a single actor. So yes, we can look at the United States and say that was the main leader. And of course, the United States still has a lot of uh, power and it has you know, the currency, the dollar as the international currency, but we are in a much more complex world than we were at that time. It's decentralized globalization, particularly in the case of finance. So globalization of finance post Bretton Woods gives rise to multiple international financial centers across the globe. So the decentralized allows or, or, or makes it that it, across the globe you'll see these centers coming up. And the last place to see them coming up is in Africa. We see them in Latin America, we see them in Europe, we see them in Asia more recently. And now my argument is that we begin to see these arriving, arising in Africa. There is no institutional nexus of global credit, credit networks because of the way of how finance is. And uh, emerging powers are establishing new centers. So the question is, you know, in Africa, which centers will the, these be to, in, to hook them into? Maybe I'll just jump. I'm not sure how much time I have left. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. So the way I'm seeing it, I, I've identified what I consider to be the main center. So Mauritius, I'm actually not looking at in my book, but it's an important site center as an offshore because it is a, as well trying to compete with East Africa as become relevant, not just as an offshore center in the, uh, at, in the Indian Ocean, but as well trying to compete for um, East African. So I see it as being Johannesburg, which is a no-brainer, Eco-Atlantic, which is in Lagos, Casablanca, for uh, North Africa um, and Nairobi in the east. And so Africa's financial center, I see it as connecting financial cities. So yes, the regional integration will take place through trade, but I do not see going any deeper into political federations or into monetary unions at a sub-regional level. What I see is certain countries emerging that are going to lead the integration around their financial hubs. So basically, uh, sorry, Southern Africa, and that's un uncontested. Of course, Johannesburg situates itself as, you know, the, the financial center for the rest of Africa. South African businesses and banking and finance is very active, but there's a pushback by other African centers. Casablanca for North Africa, and interestingly, in the ranking of financial centers, Casablanca has already overtaken Johannesburg as the most ease of business. So Casablanca has a shot forward, and I think it was in 2011, it was situated and set up by, uh, by the king, by the state, to become this financial center, and it's just been full, you know, full steam ahead. And it is being assisted by Paris and by London. So behind all these centers, you're seeing as well one of the powers trying to situate these centers. Lagos in the west um, is the hub for West Africa. There is a secondary center in Accra, uh, Abidjan, but after look, hearing again about the CFA, you know, there's a good reason why the African countries, the Af African countries are not coming up as these um, financial centers. So people say, well, Accra, but Accra, which I was, I was in Accra in July, it's a very good secondary center for Lagos. Lagos is crazy. And if you've been to Lagos, it's just completely crazy. And it is being driven by the, the Lagos state governor. It's not being driven by Abuja. It's not being driven by Buhari. It's a sub-national. It's a mega city that's becoming the hub for West Africa. 
Nairobi in the east, I think that that's where the, um, there is the most geopolitics, because I don't think anybody can compete with Lagos in the west. In the east, um, so Kenya is the only financial center, but if you look into the history of the EAC, the East African community, there have been you know, the moments when the, the community was formed and then dissolved because of, of different values between socialism and like, Tanzania, a more capitalist bent within Kenya. And what you're seeing in, in East Africa is this way to try and curb uh, Kenyatta and Kenya's um, rising hegemony within East Africa. But it will still be Nairobi that will be the main center for that region. Okay. Um, so the African Exchange Link Project. So how do you connect a continent of shallow financial markets? How do you try and deepen that? At the same time, there has been a move within the African Development Bank and within, uh, I would say, actors and stakeholders more generally in, in Africa, away from donor money, away from aid, towards private capital as the means for development. So less reliance on aid and more reliance on markets and capital markets to try and meet the needs. But at the same time, you have the paradox where actually the markets aren't deep enough and not uh, connected enough to be able to do that. So you see the African Development Bank, and um, here we have uh, the African Development P President, Adesina, and Oscar Onyema from the CEO of the Nigerian Stock Exchange. And he's also the he was the president of the African sorry, Stock Exchange Association, they established ALEP, which is the African Exchanges Linkage Project. So what I'm seeing is really a project of integration around financial centers and around their uh, different stock exchanges as a means, to, as a motor for trying to get the capital necessary for development and to try to develop, to integrate the continent. So what they have done is they've connect, they've identified the same cities, and I was happy to say that this came after my research, that they are connecting. They have identified four cornerstones for that connection. Casablanca, Johannesburg, Nigeria, and Nairobi. And they're saying these are the cardinal four points of the continent from which we will then try and integrate and deepen um, financial markets within the continent by acting as regional hegemons. So this is very far from this idea of monetary autonomy for each state, for each state trying to see how they can do it. This is geopolitics. This is hegemonic power in each region trying to situate themselves. And I would say it's pretty much settled for each of the countries. I don't see, yes, there could be rivalry in, in East Africa. I don't see anybody competing with Lagos. If you just see what all the, I haven't got time really to go into all what Lagos is doing. And Casablanca, you know, coming here to Tunisia, it's interesting to see, you know, who's going to compete with Casablanca? Egypt is turned towards the Middle East. I mean, Egypt could be, and Egypt has a very strong uh, stock exchange, but Egypt is very much involved in looking with China, the Belt and Road Initiative and the Suez Canal, moving towards, you know, the connections with Saudi Arabia and Jordan on that side. So really for the Northern African countries, Casablanca has emerged and has this amazing narrative you know, we are reconnecting to the um, sub-Saharan trade connections of, you know, the, the 14th and 13th century. So they're bringing up this narrative of connectivity to sub-Saharan Africa and say we are the natural gateway for actors in Europe and Latin, uh, sorry, and North America to come and do business. And so Casablanca is bilingual. It's, um, it's a financial center. It's, it's a financial zone. And if you want, I can go into some you know, Q&A about how this is being articulated in different urban areas. It's being articulated very different in each city, that how, how they have the regulation to try and uh, anchor the um, financial in there. So basically, the Alep confers this potential sub-regional leadership to South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and Morocco. And interestingly enough, apart from, from Morocco, which actually has made its hub Anglophone, there aren't any Francophone countries in there. And there's, you know, the whole, uh, is, it, is it purely legacy? Is it a question to do with, say, sub-national levels like decentralization in Nigeria, which confers so much power to the sub-national level, which is the, the, the Lagos state governor? Is it the way that Kenya is it, it decentralizing and making Nairobi special? Is it about Gauteng and all the migration into that area around Santon and Midrand and Johannesburg? So, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. More like uh, processes, uh, processes of uh, 
de-sovereignization, I suppose we might call it, uh, particularly in the re recent period post uh, debt relief in the mid-2000s. Uh, and I'm looking at the case of Zambia. This comes out of a larger research project that I'm leading um, that's looking at the external financing of uh, domestic expenditures. Um, and uh, Zambia is one of the cases. Uh, I have to confess I'm no expert on Zambia, although the things I'm looking at, experts of Zambia don't probably know much of either, so, so I think we're even there. But, um, and I think also Zambia is an interesting case. It might be a bit of an outlier because it's uh, heavily, heavily dependent on one export, copper, 80% of its goods trade exports is, is in copper. Uh, so there might be some exceptionalism here. Uh, but as I've been exploring the issues uh, that I've been looking at in the larger project, I've been, what's been coming up is some startling um, insights into what I would call very rapid and intense processes uh, of, of uh, emerging of new forms of, you could argue, dependency. Um, and it'd be interesting to compare it to what you're talking about as well. Uh, in terms of, um, yeah, we might call it financialization, but I think, and this is a point I've made when in previous conferences in terms of how do we understand financialization on the peripheries in poorer countries, because a lot of the literature on financialization in emerging economies is focused on South Africa, Turkey, and so on, and sees financialization is very much being expressed as the deepening of financial markets domestically. Whereas I think what we're seeing in these more types of poor peripheral situations that don't have well-developed financial centers is we're seeing a form of sort of external financialization. What Akus, Yilmaz Akus talks about is this rapid increase in li liabilities and assets on the external balance sheets while causing actually what you could call forms of quite intense financial repression in the domestic economy. Um, uh, and, and, and then that's essentially recreating a new form of sort of hyper-financialized dependency in these settings. Uh, and it's also, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find the right word for it. I'm, I'm still trying to explore for it. I've, last night I came up with this idea of a, it's almost as if it's a subsidiarization of the external accounts of these countries by non-financial uh, non corporations in terms of how they're essentially financializing their operations uh, using the country's external accounts for, for this purpose. So um, I'll try to uh, explain that to you uh, and convince you of the story uh, through a series of graphs and so on. Um, what was I saying here? Just a second, I have to get my glasses to read my own writing. But um, um, And I think the important point, too, is that it's not just financial, but the financial is also transforming sort of the, the structural nature of the economy at the same time. And I think it's a more, it's a broader issue than simply the issue of capital flight or the issue of illicit flows. And I think, if anything, the issue when, although I think the work of people like Nadi Kumana and, and Boyce and others is very important in looking at capital flight, uh, it does nonetheless focus attention onto uh, things like illicit flows or discrepancies and so on, whereas this is what are actually recorded capital flows that are official and that are having a profound restructuring of economies as we speak over the last 10 or 15 years. So if I just go ahead, oh, here's just a few uh, humorous slides of, uh, you know, Bloom Bloomberg actually gives good news on these things because I suppose because they're reporting for people who are investing in these frontier assets, uh, bonds and so on. But of course, you know, here, the, the, this is after, of course, a run on the currency and then it was stabilized and suddenly the bonds were doing well, but a year later, it's all doing bad again. And a year later, of course, Zambia's new finance minister wants to restart talks with the IMF. So this is over the last three or four years we've been looking at the country going through a sort of chronic crisis uh, and dragged out negotiations with the US that they haven't concluded, partly because they probably experienced some respite in 2017, but they're back into the, um, the crunch now in terms of uh, negotiating with the IMF again. Uh, and just to give a bit of background in terms of the theoretical perspective I'm taking, which does come from development economics, just the classic structuralism, uh, which is just this understanding, well, oh, maybe I'll skip through the slide quickly because I don't want to spend too much time on it. But what I'm doing here is in terms of methods, I would call it sort of a historical structural approach, inductive, we might say, into exploring the uh, external accounts, i.e. balance of payments, which I would have fit well into the, others, the next session as well in that sense. Um, and uh, I make a few points here that I actually won't spend any time on. Um, besides the last one, and if Fidel was here, I'm not sure if he is, just making the point that in this case, the government is very constrained by their tax revenue and their borrowing in terms of their spending, uh, but I won't get into that. Uh, but what I, what I do want to say is that when we're looking at the balance of payments, I think we're looking at, if I can, if I can draw two classic models, uh, 
uh, which I think are very important, and refer back to, again to what Fidel was talking about in the morning, is that in the classical post-war setting, developmentalism typically generated very deep trade deficits, goods, def goods trade deficits in particular, uh, in the classic cases of South Korea, Taiwan, and so on. And that's because late industrialization is a very import-intensive activity. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, this is a, a critique I would make with a lot of the heterodox economic scholarship, uh, which likes to insist that South Korea didn't actually, basically didn't rely on foreign finance because uh, they were able to export their way uh, independently uh, to industrialization. Whereas actually what we find in the case of South Korea was these extremely deep trade goods deficits being financed by aid and uh, huge amounts of debt, uh, which was actually exceptionally provided and allowed it to pass through very uh, uh, vulnerable states of, uh, of, of crisis when other uh, areas of the world, including North Africa, were basically hit and had no uh, uh, relief in the way South Korea did. And I think the important point here is what we're seeing is that we're seeing um, a, a variety of surpluses in the current account uh, counterbalancing the deficits on the goods account, resulting in a fairly, well, not always, uh, um, a current account uh, balanced here, balanced over there, going into deep deficit in the 70s, which is being then supported by heavy amounts of, of borrowing. But if we just contrast that to the other classic iconic case of Brazil, we see an op opposite pattern. And this is the pattern, this is what informed dependency theory. I mean, the dependency theory of the Latin Americans, the dependency of Cardoso, Furtado, and people like that, is they were referring to this type of situation in Brazil where essentially countries coming out of the colonial er area were typically running goods deficit, goods surpluses to finance deficits on the rest of the current accounts. Uh, it's particularly services and income accounts. Uh, because the services and income accounts were dominated by payments to foreigners, your transport and other activities were dominated by foreigners. So these were all f service, service accounts in that sense are essentially payments to foreigners. And income accounts are obviously dominated by profit remittances and p interest payments on debt. And so actually you have a lot of countries most of the, uh, coming, at, coming out of the colonial era actually running goods surpluses which today we seem to be see as a good thing, but actually counterintuitively, it's not very developmental in that sense. And it's not redistributive, it's actually counter redistributive. And they're f running goods deficits to pay for, uh, surpluses to pay for the deficits on the rest of the accounts. So if we just flip over to Zambia, we see, oh, and this, oh, sorry, before I flip over to Zambia, this is just to make the case that a tra no trade, de we have to differentiate between different types of trade deficits in the sense that you have developmental trade deficits, like in the case of Korea, and you have uh, contractionary trade deficits, as in the case of, say, Zambia or Latin America in the 80s, uh, where here, I mean, you can see the dark one is, is South Korea. Essentially, you can make the argument here that the pre-existing sort of the, its success in taking off and manufacturing exports was dependent on a pre-existing ability to import massively, right? Which had it to be financed uh, because it was generating these very, very deep deficits. Uh, and in the absence of that, your, your ability to actually move into manufacturing exports is extremely constrained as happened in the case of Brazil. Um, <clears throat> And then instead we see in the case of Zambia, and particularly in the 80s and 90s, well, there's a bunch of missing data here from the IMF, but uh, what we see is actually these types of um, <coughs> goods deficits in certain periods here, like in the 90s, is a very contractionary goods deficit in the sense that both exports and imports were collapsing at the time. Imports fell by, by half in this period of the late 90s, which of course on an economy where they're structurally dependent on imports for the functioning economy is, is dramatic. It's, it's, we're talking about a massive depression, really. I mean, these are the terms we should be using to describe this situation as depression, not recession, not uh, a stagnation, right? Um, and um, which is, I think, the point Tandika Makandiri is trying to make a lot of the time. Uh, but what you see here, other outside of these depressionary periods, what we see is, is similar to Brazil, a classic commodity exporting poor peripheral country f having a structure of balanced payments where they're typically running good surpluses to pay more or less compensating deficits on the income and services account. And so as they take off into this commodity boom period, they're also, you're having this major deficits on, on, um, on um, the income account, which is mostly, uh, which is mostly, um, which is largely, well, I'll get into that in a moment, but also the service account is very important here. And I mean, this is also Tunisia, you're talking a lot about tourism. Tourism is 
comp compensating the major deficits here in the service account, but you still end up with the service account being a major, major drag on the balance of payments. Uh, and of course, the two I've highlighted here is transport, where it's mostly freight transport. So as your commodity boom takes off, your payments to freight transport, transport, which is dominated by foreigners, essentially payments to foreigners, then takes off as well and eats, out, eats a significant portion of your, your good surplus, but also other services, which is finance, real estate, tourism companies owned by foreigners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, uh, and also the key point here on the primary income account is what's very interesting in the case of Zambia is you have this transformation. It looks like a consistent deficit throughout, but you have this very important transformation in the... Also, one thing here, by the way, this is nominal figures. If you would be looking at a country like a rapidly developing country like Korea or whatever, even if these are net balances, if you would just put in nominal fingers, figures, it would just be like a, you know, increasing like that, right? Whereas here in Zambia, you can see the, the degree of the constraint of the economy that's under, whereas actually, even if we just put it nominal and in current value, it, it, there's not actually a huge increase in the values that we're seeing over this 30 or 40 year period. Uh, but what we see in the, in the earlier period, so this is the debt crisis era, structural adjustment era, where basically the, current, the, the income account is dominated by interest payments on debt. And then you get the, basically the reduction of the debt load with uh, 2005, but then you have this huge expansion here following that of then uh, profit and remittances, uh, part of which are just pure remittances going out of the country and part of which are reinvested earnings. So these come back again on the foreign direct investment account uh, later on, uh, uh, on the financial account. Um, and this is just putting it in terms of uh, proportionate terms, in terms of percentage of GDP. So uh, we're looking at... Now, obviously, the, the IMF likes this because previously you were looking at discrepancies of a current account deficit in the range of almost 20% of GDP being financed by aid flows of 20% of GDP. This is an extremely depressed setting, uh, again, very contractionary. And where it streamlines, and now we're looking at uh, you know, um, uh, proportions in the range of 2 3 4 5% in the various accounts of GDP. Uh, but I think what's... what's um, what needs to be emphasized there as well is that the, the, well, the other thing too is that this figure here, which is net errors and omissions, which is what people are using to detect capital flight or illicit flows and so on, looks very, very, very orderly. It looks very well managed. We have a very well managed accounting system here. It's because all of the action, this is what I was discovering, all the action is actually happening on the financial account. And this is the financial account. And if I, I mean, cut the, c c to cut the story short, you can read about this once I finish the paper in, uh, in more detail. Uh, but essentially what um, you see happening in Zambia, how much time do I have left? Okay, well, let's make it a long six minutes. Uh, the, what you essentially have here is, uh, this is debt relief going on in Zambia. And then coming out of debt relief, you have this other thing appearing here, this massive surge in other investment, which is debt basically, debt, uh, debt instruments and so on, but it's, it's not portfolio, so it's not bond issues. The bond issues are here. And don't forget, this is BMP6 reporting, so this is an inflow even though it's negative because it's a, a, an increase in net liabilities. So the, bond, the, the Zambia entering bond markets is being recorded here, but parallel to that, you have this huge surge of, of, of um, resident Zambians holding a net increase in debt assets being held abroad by resident Zambians. So I'm thinking, okay, what the hell is this, right? <laughs> it's because, well, so in, uh, obviously it's, it's, uh, is it, it's probably not individual Zambians. Uh, it's more likely the corporate sector, like Anglo-America, Zambia is a resident of Zambia. So Anglo-American Zambia has maybe an account in Switzerland and is holding assets in that account in Switzerland. Uh, it might be a story like that. And if we focus on that in more detail, uh, just to give you a, the idea of the proportions here, uh, that peak that we saw in 2012, I think it is, which is also the, when you had the peak in the commodity boom, that peak in 2012 was equivalent to, um, well, 30% of GDP. So 30% of, of GDP was being taken abroad as debt assets held by resident Zambians abroad, right? Uh, 
Um, so it obviously raises huge questions of what exactly, oh, sorry, sorry, no, I, I read that wrong. Sorry, <laughs> I, I didn't think, this, sorry, this is debt relief. Debt relief was, uh, uh, this is the peak here, which is uh, almost 20%, yeah. I, I thought something was wrong when I was saying that. Uh, so almost 20% of uh, the GDP in that single year was transferred abroad as debt assets held by resident Zambians. Um, so if we go into that account in more detail, what we essentially see is that the other investment account is being broken up into, uh, there's t it's dominated by two categories essentially, right? On one hand, you see the category of net acquisition of financial assets, which is almost entirely made up of, as I said, debt instruments held by other sectors, which is not the government sector, it's the private sector. Uh, it's the non-financial corporate sector. Uh, and then you have the net occurrence of liabilities, which is almost entirely dominated by the government borrowing. And this is, again, not the government borrowing through bonds, it's government borrowing in terms of just debt, right? So what you're seeing is that parallel to debt, re after debt relief, you see the government slowly getting into more and more net borrowing until now it's almost equal to its, uh, the, the assets being held abroad. And parallel to that process, coming right out of debt relief here, uh, you have this very rapid increase in these assets being held abroad. So it appears as if debt relief, at least, even if it wasn't directly related to whatever's going on here, it facilitated this process, perhaps through then the institutional mechanisms through which debt relief was negotiated and conditioned on uh, in terms of liberalization of financial accounts or liberalization of the activities of various transnational corporations and so on. So um, I got this far in trying to understand what was going on and then my field work, I mean, a lot of my research was just to take advantage of the chance to have an excuse to go sit down with central bank people and talk to them about these types of things. And so I sat down with the central bank people, and after asking them about a whole bunch of other things, they said, Lenny, last questions. I said, yes, can you explain this to me? And they were like, oh, you know. Okay, and they, they had themselves had been trying to figure this out with the IMF's help, in fact. Uh, so they themselves were not even necessarily clear of uh, what this exactly was representing. But what they were guessing is that it was largely the mining sector, although you, know, you could broaden that out to various other corporate actors in the economy. Uh, and, and they actually, it was actually their construction, they parked all the data here, uh, because what they, what they realized was that there was a discrepancy between their own reporting and the reporting on the Bank of International Settlements. Because international banks, don't report to them, but they report to the BIS. So by, by seeing that discrepancy, they assume that basically all this huge outflow on the financial account of, as we see in one year, 20% of GDP, uh, 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 was basically, say, the corporations resident in Zambia holding assets abroad in the form of debt assets, and it's not clear. So the reality is, based on that explanation, we know there's this massive outflow from the economy. We don't exactly know what it is, neither does the central bank and neither does the IMF. Um, and they classified it as these assets. Now, we could be cynical and say they were just trying to hide it away in a part of the financial account where no one would actually see it besides myself uh, because I'm so nosy. But the um, uh, reality is if you would consider this to be, for instance, classic transfer pricing, you would need to bring it over to the arrows and emissions. Suddenly, you end up with arrows of emissions in the range of 20% of GDP. All, you know, all hell breaks loose and alarms go off and so on. Or if you consider it as part of... Uh, um, a misinvoicing on trade. They, it completely messes up with all the trade accounts and so on. But instead, it was you, what you see on the current account side, it was quite of a nicely managed, regulated, reported current account, looks like it's all in order and so on. And all of these outflows of to, you know, uh, being parked over here. Uh, and, and so essentially what you, s and, and also what, what's happening towards the end of this period is as this boom comes to an end, the commodity boom comes to an end, the, 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 they, have a, they have a currency crash, uh, they're struggling, negotiating with the IMF, it's all grounding to a halt, uh, basically sort of teetering on economic crisis, uh, and this whole process slows down, but still at a significant level, it still outflows in the range of uh, over, you know, a, in 2018 of a billion and a half, uh, and in that context, the government is winding down its bond issues because it's promised the IMF to borrow less. So it's basically actually paying back its bonds and not issuing any new bonds. But in the meantime, also increasing its, its, its borrowing to the extent where it's all pretty much equal right now. And if anything, in 2019, it looks like it might even be surpassing. So it's what uh, Nidhi Kumana and Boyce call perhaps uh, or the revolving door. And they're not referring to the 
people working in the central bank and then working in the IMF afterwards and going back to the central bank, but they're referring to basically government borrowing, financing capital flight, which is essentially what we're uh, probably looking at here. It's not a direct relationship, but it's the fact that to compensate for these outflows, the government is increasingly taking on heavier, heavier debt loads where the debt, I mean, I think in 2019, the debt, the external debt load of Zambia now is at around 91%, so it's substantial, in order to facilitate the economy, these operations in the economy. Uh, uh, so I have to wrap up, don't I? It's a, as a very last point, just to conclude, okay. as a very last point, just to conclude, what this is doing is creating this huge distortion in the domestic economy. And if we just look at interest rate structures here, uh, I mean, this is the severe period of extremely austere, uh, austere uh, high interest rate policy that was crippling the economy, but they come out of that. Um, and what you see parallel to these surges happening is for the first time, even in comparison to the SAP period, we find the lending rate falling below the treasury bill rate and the discount rate, uh, which it, I, actually I even question these data because actually, you know, in, during field work in 2017, for instance, it was clear the lending rate was more around 30 or 40 percent. But again, we're talking about, I mean, you in Tunisia, you're talking about 12%. In this economy, if you want to set up a small business, for instance, you're looking at borrowing money at 30 to 40%. Uh, but it's describing an economy that's become extremely, in the domestic financial sphere, extremely uh, repressed and dysfunctional and contractionary to facilitate these externalized processes of, of capital flows running through the economy. And on that point, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Uh, merci. En plus, être autoritaire pour un Tunisien, 7 novembre, c'est un peu, c'est un peu problématique. Alors, vous en avez peut-être pas parlé, mais en tout cas, pour ceux, vous en avez parlé ce matin. Ah, d'accord. Alors, pour ceux qui sont là à Tunis, euh, qui savent pas la symbolique du 7, en fait, c'est la date du coup d'état de Ben Ali en 1987. Donc, du coup, euh, c'est un peu difficile de, de répondre à la demande de, de l'autoritarisme de Mahé Ben Gatha. <rire> Merci à vous deux. Euh, je profite... Euh, je rebondis sur le titre de votre intervention. Alors, vous parlez d'hémorragie. Oui. Euh, N'hésitez pas. Vous avez... Ah, vous avez... Oh, on a laissé la masse ah, on va le partir. D'accord. Alors, est-ce que euh, vous avez identifié des voies de, 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 de coagulation euh, du sang pour euh, limiter cette hémorragie Ou est-ce que le gouvernement, qui n'arrive pas à identifier exactement ce qui se passe dans les, dans les flots externes, euh, prend ça comme, une, comme un centre d'intérêt pour euh, à juguler, à maîtriser euh, ah. Si je peux juste... Euh, bah, euh, ça, ça c'est pas une hémorragie, non c est, c est, Ça, c'est des flux... Ça, je vous donne juste le micro parce que j'imagine que me, mes collègues sont en train d'enregistrer l'audio. Ah, oui, 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 Donc, euh... non, mais c'est juste pour clarifier. Ça, c'est ça, c'est l'époque, le seul époque où tu avais un surplus dans le dans le, le trade goods account mm -hmm. à cause de les prix de cuivre. Et donc, pour une certaine période, ils avaient. Mais ça, c'est très grand en termes de j'oublie le pourcentage, mais c'est c'est donc pour quelques années. Mais tout ça, c'était. C'était, how do you say, it was dwarfed by the, the scale of the you outflows. You can use English happening. if you want. Yeah, I'll use the, it was dwarfed by the scale of the outflows on the financial account. So these are outflows, right? These are outflows. They're being, they're, or the question is, is are they properly classified outflows? And are they being hidden away in the financial account so no one notices them? But they are reflecting something that's going on. That is a massive outflow of wealth from the economy. Now, so is it transfer pricing by transnational corporations? I mean, there's a, a lot of people argue that in this period, there was like transfer pricing in the range of two to three billion a year, which could account for a lot of this. And then some people then criticize that. Maya Forstater comes up on Twitter every time anyone suggests there's two or three billion and says, no, it's probably more 100 million or 200 million and criticizes that. But nonetheless, the, the, it, it, I think it's broader than that in that sense. It's broader than simply capital flight from individuals taking their money out of the country. But it is through the financialized, operas, financialized operations of a largely foreign-owned corporate sector in the economy taking massive amounts of assets out of the country during a boom period, which was the only time the country could have used these uh, surplus to then invest it into... Um, into into development, essentially. We're talking about Zambia. It's fascinating too because it's a, you go to the country and there is a, uh, their electricity generation capacity and or the sewage system in Lusaka. Uh, 
were basically put on hold in 1978 and had not been touched until like basically when I was there in 2017. They were just revving up these types of development projects, all of which require intensive amounts of foreign exchange. So it, it's, it's uh, in, in exchange, the donors want to do cash transfers and things like that, right? So that's basically, I, I hope the hemorrhage is clearer now. Clearer, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Il y a une autre question que j'aimerais vous poser, Elisabeth Covet. Alors, vous évoquez le, cette, les CAF, cette zone de libre-échange continentale. Et moi, ce qui m'intrigue dans cette zone de libre-échange continentale, qui est promue en partie par la BAT, je pense qu'elle intrigue beaucoup de gens d'ailleurs, euh, c'est que c'est en partie une volonté qui est euh, poussée par euh, des acteurs supranationaux, comme notamment la Banque mondiale ou l'Union européenne. Et en même temps, l'Union européenne est en train de tisser des relations euh, des FTAs avec plusieurs pays, en parallèle de la zone de libre-échange continentale. Alors, comment cela s'inscrit dans votre lecture de ces euh, centres, décentralis euh, des centres financiers décentralisés qui sont dans les quatre points cardinaux du continent Okay, so I'm going to answer in English. Um, just to be clear that you're getting onto trade. It's not my area, right? Yeah, okay. and that's the first step of the well, it, beloved so, monetary so the beloved union you're talking about. The idea is that you go from an FTA to a customs union to a common market to a monetary union. Yeah. So going from an FTA to a monetary union is like from flying here to the moon. Okay? okay. In sense of political coordination and collaboration. So... Your, your, so your question is, why are they doing that? Why are the sub-regional powers signing up to that? Mm, not, not exactly. Actually, it's how is uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement yeah. uh, in harmony or not with this uh, lecture of the financial uh, polls? Well, sure, sure it is, because, I mean, uh, well, first of all, Buhari took a very long time to sign up. And I was just thinking, interesting, because Nigeria didn't, was very reluctant to sign up to the, what is the very lightest type of integration. So just on Nigeria, I can show it, it shows a very clear sign that if Bahari had a hard time even rectifying the, the uh, free trade agreement on Africa, we are so far from a uh, continental monetary unit, it's not even funny. Okay, just as a sense of political will. Why? Because there's very little intra-African trade. So it's going to be beneficial to actually increase that trade for all, all, all countries. For Nigeria, the interest would be that you, if, if Nigeria is a gateway, it's a flow, you want a movement of goods. So Nigeria around Lagos is setting, just give an example, set up s several processing zones. With China, without China, Dangote's big new petrochemical refinery happening in, in Lekki. So it's setting itself up not only as a financial center, but as a gateway for flows. And the flows are the trade flows as well. Not people, not common market, okay, uh, and not a customs market, but you, you are setting up so that the flows that are coming through are not only financial, but financial related to trade. So it's in the interest. And it's in the interest, for example, of Kenya, who's trying to use um, China's Belt and Road Initiative to get all the pipelines and the railways and all the different infrastructure coming through Nairobi and coming through Kenya, which is where Tanzania... So this, I, I see it sort of like a fight along the East African coast, if you're looking about trade, mm -hmm. connecting, to, to, um, connecting to trade more largely but not connected to China, between uh, Dar es Salaam, Bogomoyo, Mombasa and the new uh, Lamu port. So there's a competitivity in between the big megaports of East Africa who helped to position, who, who helped to, who, sorry, who wish to be positioned, or, or the, the countries position them as those centers for um, the flows. So the trade is an important part of that. Um, so I think it's not a big risk for um, African actors and leaders to sign up to the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. It doesn't have a lot of commitment. It doesn't need a lot of coordination, of collaboration. It doesn't jeopardize their, their sovereignty. It doesn't jeopardize their hegemony. Okay. But meanwhile, the, 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 the regional trade, uh, free trade zones in mm -hmm. Africa, as you're talking in your paper, uh, mm -hmm. stating in your paper, are not really in a very good health right now. No. So exactly. where is the sense of thinking about the the first uh, step and uh, which is the, 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 this uh, financial uh, the monetary, monetary union. union while the first Exa conditional uh, is not, uh, exactly. not respected yet. which is my point is why it's not going to happen so, so the i think the african so i think the again. continental free trade is 
uh, African Union, African Development Bank, and in international financial institutions, you know, making sort of like a basic common sense to try and do that, and it'll override the stuck and stalled processes within each of the sub-regional areas. First of all, um, Morocco is an outlier. Okay, Morocco doesn't even have connection, or you know, with uh, with Algeria, and Morocco is actually more connected to the Middle East. And so, you know, Morocco is a bit of a strange, but it's placing itself financially not in the trade, apart from the phosphate, which may connect with Nigeria. So I think it's a way of trying to overcome the stalled processes in each sub-regional level of integration, but I, I don't think that it will deepen, not at continental, not even at, at a sub-regional level, because of politics and power. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes, okay, so... Ten minutes. It's a fast conference. Yeah, uh, bah, du coup, je, je profite. Uh, je vais pas monopoliser la parole, monsieur et monsieur. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Fisher about that, that, that period. Wasn't that the period uh, of the commodity boom? So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the, um, the Zambian companies, the Zambian mm -hmm. copper companies, didn't they have like uh, deposits abroad where they received the copper revenue? Wouldn't that mean the, that difference? Yeah, yeah, except that would, that would be cash held abroad, but there's, these are debt instruments abroad. But the, uh, well, uh, but the thing is that Zambian, most of the copper is being developed, obviously, by Anglo-American and a few other, uh, I think, Australian, Canadian, South African firms and so on. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. One of the explanations for this is basically they're holding, I mean, technically speaking, they're supposed to declare their, 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 mm -hmm. their, their earnings, their revenues locally, right? But one of, the, one of the problems that the central bank has to regulate it is that actually what they said is that the financial sector was quite well regulated. It was quite disciplined in the sense and not a lot, they didn't think any of this was happening through the financial sector. Uh, the problem is that they, the, 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 the non-financial corporations, the mining companies don't have to report to the corporate, uh, to mm -hmm. the central bank even though uh, they are essentially involved in huge amounts of financial transactions, right? Uh, so the question is, that, yeah, I mean, they sell, I mean, the largest market for Zambian copper is Switzerland, but the copper never goes to Switzerland, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it's these types of things going on where you, you have these companies operating at a global scale uh, where a lot of the transaction, the goods transactions are actually fictive, but they are generating streams of income. And those streams of income are, as you say, ending up elsewhere in the world <laughs> being deposited in bank accounts. And for some reason, this is the central bank declared it as debt assets. That's what I don't also don't understand is why they, why they declared it as debt assets. Or maybe it's of, it could be, for instance, a form of hiding profits via using loans from, uh, but that doesn't even make sense because it could be like Anglo-American Zambia making a loan to the mother company or the, you know, the, the, the parent company. But then why would that then be of interest to Anglo-American to do that? Because that would actually reverse profits back to Zambia. So mm -hmm. the whole thing is very dysfunctional. But what it is reflecting is the fact that there's this huge amount of activity, uh, outflow uh, in the economy. Because with, without, if, we, if we look at that, that huge surge there of red, basically as errors and omissions that we can't explain, mm -hmm. at least it flows in that sense, uh, it's, it still has to be there because that's the only way that the financial account can balance and be the, the mirror image of the current account, right? So something's going on there and maybe these should actually be classified as error and as emissions, but they chose to classify them that way. But what it is reflecting is this huge outflow from the economy in a boom time. So it's a classic dependency, uh, a very, almost a colonial type of setting, we might say, where uh, where the, the, the resource exploitation is dominated by foreign companies and a huge, and we're talking about a huge resource transfer from the domestic economy out of the economy uh, uh, in one way or the other. The challenge for me now is to try and explain the institutional mechanisms of this, of exactly how is it taking place, and I don't have an answer for that, but that's obviously what would be interesting. There's, you know, I, I got this far, so that's pretty good, I think. Anyways. La réflexion est en cours, c'est excellent. Alors, il y a Monsieur puis Hafewa. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, Zambia is uh, a very poor uh, country, and uh, it did um, it uh, benefited from uh, the uh, HIPC, 
uh, initiative, uh, so it's that was uh, somehow uh, relieved. Uh, but uh, this uh, that relief uh, didn't seem to solve the problem. Why? Yeah. Uh, because it's still struggling uh, yeah. with debt, and uh, it it can't uh, make policies for uh, economic development. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Um, this is for Dr. Elizabeth. Um, in your presentation, you in, uh, identify some established and uh, emerging uh, financial homes in Africa. And you did say, I, I guess I had you mention the fact that um, uh, the rise of these um, uh, hubs uh, was di dictated by uh, some uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, imperatives. So I wish to ask, what are these imperatives? And um, uh, what is the implication for uh, Pan-African financial integration? Thank you. Uh, we, the, the debt relief is, is, is this, this room here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I keep forgetting. Hello. Oh, yeah. uh, so the debt relief is this boom here. And that actually doesn't, it's a bit um, um, uh, misleading because it doesn't represent any actual in or out flows of foreign exchange into the economy because effectively what they're doing is they're writing off the debt on the capital account and then it has the corresponding uh, reduction on the financial account. So this represents a reduction of liabilities, uh, the thick red line. But in effect, it doesn't really have any real effect on the economy besides lowering uh, your interest payments on debt. So I mean, for instance, uh, if we go back to the slide where I show the interest payments, uh, what we see is debt reduction basically uh, reduced this down to that. That would have been the real financial effect on the economy in terms of uh, but what it, what it also appears to have then allowed, and I, this would be the answer to your question of why they couldn't use debt reduction developmentally, well, one reason, there might be many reasons, but one reason is definitely related to the conditionalities that came with debt re relief, right? And that debt relief came with a lot of, shall we say, for lack of a better term, neoliberal conditionalities or structure, uh, uh, um, uh, of li li basically liberalizing. And it also came, and it also, it, but it's also the timing of debt relief, and I don't know if, the fact that debt relief was timed with this huge surge in commodity prices, and hence there was an interest from corporations to enter into the Zambian economy and to start to secure their assets and also to have a certain degree of freedom in how they manage their, 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 their financial flows and also their trade flows coming out of their investments. So from a political economy angle, we might argue that there was material interests behind debt relief, not just Bono, right, uh, in that sense, or Geldof or whatever. Um, uh, so, but, so what, but, what, but definitely what appears to happen, I don't have, I can't draw the links yet, oh, that's what I'd like to try and do, is that it appears that debt relief set up the conditions in combination with the commodity boom to allow for these types of uh, outflows, which I've called hemorrhaging, because I consider losing 20% of your GDP hemorrhaging, but um, yeah, okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the, the question. Um, so I'll just try to list quickly what I think of as geopolitical and geoeconomic. A, a very first important one is access to water. It's the ports. And what's happening now, if you don't have access, which is why um, Kenya's work with China and connecting up Mombasa to Nairobi's rail was so important because Nairobi isn't on the sea. So that connectivity for Kenya was key to try and make sure that Nairobi didn't become irrelevant, but it was actually still part of the connectivity to the sea. So the sea is a huge one because we are still in, a, you know, um, of, of global, most, of, most trade passes through sea routes. So ports are hugely important, and wherever you see a hub, you're going to see port development in one way or the other. And you can see that across, in, in, well, all down West Africa and East Africa. 
Ports are not enough by themselves. You have to have the states driving. So the other variable, I would say, is state will and state determination to do something. So here we have seen Kenya very, very on with its vision 2030. I know most countries have vision 2030, 2025, 20 whatever. But very clearly, wanting to, be, to place Kenya in global finance. So you have to have the state willing to bring about change in legislation and regulation and best practices to do that. And what Kenya and other countries have done is to go and work with Singapore, Middle East, Middle East uh, financial centers, London, to bring in their best practice to make sure that they're doing everything to become credible in the eyes of global finance to make that, that um, center recognized. So you're working with financial centers elsewhere. Um, so I would say foreign policy, how those states as well are playing on foreign policy, uh, alliances, they're playing into the international big players, which you can see in all of them I'm doing. I mean, Casablanca is very closely connected to London. I mean, London has what they call the, the city London, which is how do you spearhead British finance into the rest of the world, and very close ties with how to set up a financial centre in Africa in, in, with the city of London, right? It's to do with British finance ideology, so you actually wish to make your country into a financial center, and you're ready to take on all the consequences of that and put on a rhetoric that it'll be advantageous to everybody to do that, because we know that financial centers are not advantageous to the, to the ordinary person, right? It's very hard because your monetary policy then has to comply with international movement of capital. Um, and I would say then how you going to do your urban zoning so you have to have some kind of legislation or power to reorganize the urban. So in Lagos, they've just basically built Eco-Atlantic, right? Which is, you look at pictures of Eco-Atlantic, say that's Dubai. No, that's Eco-Atlantic. So you create new spaces. Um, in Casablanca, they've taken the old airfield and they've made that into a zone of finance. In uh, Nairobi, it's more of a typical CBD, and they're now moving the finance into, the, into Westlands, into suburb, which replicates a bit Santon. So you have to have the leverage of governance capability to make sure that the zonage for the finance to actually sit there, you have, you have power to do that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Encore merci à vous. Je pense qu'on euh, a terminé avec les questions. Merci à vous d'avoir été là. Merci à vous pour vos interventions et vos réponses.